Hi, everyone. Welcome to another segment of our Mental Health Moments series. My name is Linda Gallick. I'm the Health and Wellbeing uh, Consultant here at Bell and & Health. And we're happy to bring you this monthly segment to bring you some tools and some advice um, on uh, improving and protecting your mental health. So as always, I am joined by our behavior health therapist, Charles Latour. Charles, how's your Thursday? It's going good. How about you? Going good, going good. So in honor of uh, Valentine's Day this month, Charles and I thought it would be fun to talk a little bit about relationships. And lucky for our audience today, Charles deals with this quite a bit in his practice. So Charles, what, what percent of the time do you think you spend with your clients talking about stuff that's connected to relationships? If I had to put a percentage to it, it would be really, really high. I mean, probably as high as 70 to 80 percent, maybe even a little bit more. Even if it isn't working as a couple, there's talk about a relationship, what's going on in the relationship. Uh, relationships are incredibly influential to our overall health and well-being. Yeah, when I think about the alignment that we have with Lifesaver and lifestyle medicine, one of the six pillars of lifestyle medicine is relationships. And not just romantic relationships, but all of our relationships are so important to our health and well-being. So we're looking forward to, to talking about that today. So one of the things that, Charles, you had said when we were first talking about this topic is that isolation is the new smoking, that there's actually data that better relationships make you live longer. Yes, and you know, it isn't even just the longevity of life. If we know smoking, smoking tends to be in the neighborhood of anywhere from seven to 10 years, that it's estimated that it can take on, off your lifespan or life expectancy, uh, which I usually describe as the distinguishing factor is lifespan is the number of years we live but health span is the number of healthy years that we live. And what we know, studies for the last 10 years or so have been telling us that isolation is as critical or impactful as smoking to aspects of cardiovascular health. Um, some studies tell us it makes it uh, as we're 29% more likely to have some cardiovascular illness due to isolation which is around the same percentages as smoking and uh, obesity, other health risks, 32% more likely to suffer from a stroke uh, from isolation, similar numbers to smoking. So that's why it's described recently, and I say recently as in the last five to 10 years, described as the new smoking. So obviously, you know, we want our relationships to be healthy. And uh, probably the first thing is we need to recognize when they're not healthy. How, how do we know if, if a relationship that we are partaking in is or isn't healthy? It's a really good question, especially given that um, so it's, it's not, there isn't any one specific answer. It's how happy are you in a relationship? How content are you? Do you have a trusting relationship? Do you have a caring relationship? Do you take, if it's a relationship at home, do you take that relationship to work and it impacts you? If it's a relationship at work, do you take that relationship home and it impacts you? So if it's a parent-child relationship, are you worried or thinking about your child as much at work as when you're at home? Uh, we know that these issues of relationships are so important and crucial to us, they almost don't know boundaries between home and work. That's why we take it in both ways, that we could take work home with us, especially if we had a difficult day. People, will, one of the first things they'll tell me in an appointment is, Oh, the most difficult part of my week, I had this argument with my boss or my coworker or my whomever, and I just couldn't let it go. And similarly, it could be with our partner. We could have that or with our child, whatever. We go to work and we'll tell a coworker, oh, I'm having a tough day. I had this really difficult argument with whomever. 
And sometimes even worse, we may not tell anybody and it will just fester, you know, that sort of thing too. So it's incredibly important that our relationships are as healthy and favorably impactful to us uh, rather than conversely being the case. When I think about Charles, you know, when you think about if people are having a bad day for whatever reason, how many times is it about a relationship? Whether it's a relationship with a coworker or a relationship with a family member, that a bad day is caused by something going on in a relationship. Like that's what really sticks out in my mind. Yeah, and it's it, you're absolutely right for that to stick out. That's what it is. Is Difficult things when it's with people stick with us. We are, you know, the thing is, and kind of why that's the case, we are profoundly social people. We strive to have meaningful, positive relationships, and we're negatively impacted when they don't go that way. So in order for us to be the, the best that we can be, we strive to find positive, meaningful. We are always trying to create connection. And when we do have connection, we can feel at our best. We know this even going back years and years and years. We feel stronger as a group. That's how people fought off adversity. The best teams, the best, even in the days of the caveman, it was who can we get a good coalition together to ward off what the storms of life are going to bring us. So in part, that's why relationships are so important and why we strive to have the most meaningful, connected relationships possible. One thing that I think is really interesting to think about, Charles, is the idea of knowing ourselves well enough so that we know what we're bringing to a relationship, both in a good way and in a bad way. How does that impact people's relationships? Really kind of knowing their, maybe knowing their own stumbling blocks or, or knowing their own patterns. Well, yeah, without knowing that, that's kind of it. We keep stumbling. Um, you know, a person who's been married five times and he described himself as having bad picking genes. That it's always the other person that I picked and never me. And, um, but the, the ability to, as I always call it, know thyself. What am I bringing to a relationship? What degree of stability? What degree of safety? What degree of security? What degree of fondness and admiration for my partner? Uh, knowing yourself, how you react, how you relate, how you support, and you know, finding someone who can have similar qualities of awareness, that is incredibly important. There's one thing that we have in the way of marital and relationship statistics that even bear this out because it doesn't always have to be one or the other in the relationship. And almost 50% of all marriages don't work out. 50% of all second marriages don't work out. So um, when, when you're at that place, you have some indication that I'm bringing something to this that is impacting the quality of my relationship. Knowing the best that you can know that what you do to favorably affect and not so favorably and work on that, that is central to a positive relationship. So what's your advice, Charles, when people are struggling in a relationship, whether it be a husband and a wife or a coworker, a family member, member you know, where do they start? What are your, what are your tips and tricks for, for working on that relationship? Well, let's take it in two directions first, because they could be you know, overlapping, but let's talk about work relationships first. Oftentimes I get people struggling in a work, she won't listen to me, he won't listen to me. This is listening. To be a great listener, we have to have attunement. We have to be interested, even if we start with the concept that I may not know everything already. If I could even start with the lens of, I'm going to talk with this person and I'm going to find out something maybe that I didn't know, or I'm at least going to be open to that possibility. One of the things that I find most negatively impactful to relationships across the board is this, I call it the preference to be right uh, rather than the preference for happiness. 
that we get so locked into rightness. Well, I'm right. Well, that's not what happened. That is what happened. That never happened. We have these right or wrong, fault and blame type of arguments or even discussions way too often. But if we start with a premise that I'd rather be happy than right, happiness is maybe I find out something I didn't know. Maybe I become aware of something that I totally lacked awareness of. A great conversation, communication can lead just to that. In order to get there, sometimes we even have to start with a lens of not only openness, but a lens of interest that I want to hear. I want to, I'm not only open to what I might not know, but I'm starting with this capacity to accept that you have nothing that you, you want to hurt me with just that something that I can learn from you um, so we have mutual appreciation. If we walk into it like that, we can have a much better conversation and relationship. But if we walk into any of those difficult conversations with what I call a harsh start, a harsh start will usually only go downhill from there. It usually doesn't ever really spiral virtuously to a good place, those are usually just going to go downhill. And if we could start with that in mind, we're usually going to have better conversations. And if you think of every relationship that you have, any everybody on this call, every relationship they've ever had is essentially a series of conversations. So you are, every relationship you have is the byproduct or the, the aggregate effect of all the communication and conversations you've ever had. So we strengthen or weaken our relationships, one interaction and one conversation at a time. Absolutely, and when you were talking about that, Charles, um, I was struck by um, one of the tools that we talk about in our cultural movement here at Felon is um, constant curiosity. You know, constant curiosity, that's how you build something with people, is that you get curious and you ask questions about what's going on with them and what's happening in their world. And that's really how you build it. So I think that that really applies both the workplace, personally. It's just, it's a good place to start, to really sit back and say, I'm going to listen and I'm going to ask questions about you. Well, yeah, it's a really critical point, and I use that all the time. I usually like to use this saying, which is you can't be aggravated and curious at the same time. So if you're going to have an effective conversation and you're really aggravated, frustrated, and just in that emotional, dysregulated place, hard to be really curious. But if you're really curious and interested and open to what you might hear, it's hard to be all that aggravated. And that's where that openness comes up. So. The curiosity is central to an effective conversation, especially at work, especially one that can be potentially even heated or confrontational or even mildly argumentative. So having that place of curiosity is a very effective stance to be able to approach any conversation with, regardless of how friendly or, or heated it might be. It's the key to it. And one of the things that you and I had talked about was this idea of relationships being, when you show up in a relationship, is it regulated or deregulated? Can you explain that to the audience? Sure. So in, if you think of anybody who's on, on the call interested in the topic of emotional uh, intelligence, the key to emotional intelligence and how it relates socially is that when we are dysregulated, uh, think of a marital relationship or any friendship relationship. This is my friend or my coworker. He's usually always calm. He's usually very curious, usually very relaxed, uh, usually very friendly, usually very interested in other people and what's going on in their life. Or here's my friend. He's usually dysregulated. He's usually unhappy, unmotivated, easily irritated, easily aggravated, and not all that much fun to be with. So this regulation, that isn't like a recipe for great personal relationships, right? So having 
consistent regulation versus dysregulation is what helps us in those social contexts. And uh, even from a work standpoint, Daniel Goleman out of Harvard for some 25 years now has done some incredible work in understanding that IQ gets us in the door to do what we do, but emotional intelligence, how we manage our regulatory capacity, how we manage our emotions is what makes us more effective in what we do. So that distinction between regulation versus dysregulation is key to self-management and again, central to having the most quality relationships that we possibly can. How do we work on that, Charles? Let's say, you know, we're sitting here going, I'm not very good at that. Where, where do we start? How do we work on that and, and become better at it? You become your own personal experiment. You get feedback. There's an e emotional intelligence 360 feedback, if, especially if you're a leader, you want to know how people respond to you. Parents can do this, friends can do this, but getting feedback, getting an understanding, but really careful monitoring of yourself, who I am. And, and I always like to people to ask themselves just to get a start in the self-awareness, how do I show up? What energy am I bringing to whatever situation I'm in? What mood do I feel like I'm bringing? And how am I influencing the people that I'm with? Am I, because we know in this world of emotional intelligence and social intelligence, and why I was saying earlier, we are profoundly social people. We are always wanting to know how we're showing up and how we're influencing. And the key to that is in this dynamic. I describe it as there's this restaurant that I had seen this sign in one time. And the sign was, we love to see all of you. Some of you, it's when you come in and some of you, it's when you leave. <laughs> and I thought to myself, like, how, how there is no greater advertisement for emotional and social intelligence and personal self-regulation than that. Um, sure, they want everybody's business and they're happy when they come in, but happier when they leave. Like, what, what is that all about? And that is in how we show up, what energy we're bringing. And there's one really strong neuroscientific dynamic that is in play there, which is something called mirror neurons. And the mirror neurons are this part of our brain, the, this aspect of our, our overall neuroscientific um, hardwiring, which is we are contagious. Whatever we are bringing has a strong likelihood of having a contagious effect on the people that we are talking to. So people are either going to get a really good feeling from us, almost in a contagious way, and everybody on this call has had that experience somewhere along the way, where you come in contact with this person, you talk with them, and you walk away with, oh my God, I feel fantastic. I can't believe how great I feel. I just talked to Linda. I just talked to Dina. I just talked to whomever. I feel unbelievably great, right? And we also have those people who are like, oh my gosh, what just happened? <laughs> what was that? And we don't feel as great for whatever that is. And that's the reason why that experience takes place. So how we show up, knowing ourselves well enough to know what energy we're bringing, why we're bringing it. And if we don't feel that way, how can we adjust? How emotionally agile are we to be our best, even in the face of some adversity, even in the face of things not going well, can I still summon the best me? That is the, one of the greatest indicators of emotional intelligence and then how we get along in the relationships that we are part of. And I think it's really important to note, too, and this really goes with that contagious part of we can't make another person happy. It's, it's not our responsibility to make another person happy. What we can control is how we act and what we bring to the table. So if I go home and I right away start being crabby at my husband, what am I doing? I'm bringing crabbiness to the table, and that potentially can be contagious, and he can catch on to that, and, and now we're going to have an argument about something. 
versus if I'm nice and I bring that to the table, right? Yeah, and oftentimes one you're talking earlier, so, so that's right on target. That's how that happens, and we might not even know we do that. And one of the things that I see very problematic with that type of dynamic is I call this the Groundhog Day dynamic or dialogue, where these things just seem to happen day after day after day, almost like that Groundhog Day movie. And I, I meet with couples all the time and they have these Groundhog Day arguments. And the funniest thing about them is they don't even know how they started. Even their biggest arguments could be, well, what, what happened? What were you arguing about? I don't know, what were we arguing about? So you know what it was was not really that big. They can't even remember it. But the dynamic of the argument, how we keep frustrating each other, and having these Groundhog Day arguments are incredible. So uh, one of the reasons why I strongly encourage people all the time to have this transition strategy between work and home, something that helps you transition, even if it's one song on the radio or one thoughtfulness gratitude exercise, or even the, the, the deep breath, something that says, okay, I'm, I'm going home, I'm transitioning, rather than just having all those thoughts all the way home and then go in maybe even with the same, like you said, if I am a little bit irritated and I didn't transition, I may bring that, walk that right into my house and right into my partner. Absolutely. So if anyone has questions for Charles, please put those in the chat. This is your, this is your opportunity to ask anything you'd like. Um, Charles has so much experience in this area, so please, out with some questions. While you all are thinking about that, Charles, we had talked about an acronym that is uh, helpful for people maybe as a takeaway to kind of help them in, in their relationships, and that's the CARE acronym. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, and this one works in any relationship, but in this case, I'm going to talk about it maybe a little bit more in partner or committed relationships, but again, certainly transferable to uh, everything in the way of, of how we get along and interact with people. But basically at the end of the day, um, we are only the strength of our relationship on how much we care about each other. So every relationship threat comes from if there's not enough security, not enough emotional safety, and we don't know how much we love and care for each other. We call those attachment threats that lead to detachment. And the keys to attachment, knowing that we're in a loving, safe, secure relationship, you know, my acronym for it is CARE, as you said, C-A-R-E. CARE is the, the overarching that I care enough for you to love you. I care enough for you to care about you. And care and concern are like the action verbs of empathy. So we could have empathy for someone. And um, like if, if I was sitting in here and I just fell and someone said, oh, I feel terrible that you just fell, but good luck getting up. You know, so it's like they cared enough, but not really helpful and they didn't care enough to help me up. We have to know from our relationships that people care. There's a great saying, it's been around forever, it's always worth repeating, which is no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. So caring means everything. So C is care, A is availability, emotional accessibility. Are you there for me emotionally? Are you there, are you accessible? Do I have access to you? Do I matter to you enough for me to be part of your life and you be part of mine? Accessibility physically and emotionally is absolutely crucial. And ju again, just about every relationship you could argue this is part of. R is responsiveness. How responsive are you to what I need? How responsive are you to us? How responsive are you to what we have going on in our lives. When we talk, are you responsive? Are you there for me physically and emotionally responsive? 
And maybe the most important one, even though I, I think they're all equally important, is E is engagement. The engagement is all about that place of we are in this together. I am interested. I'm invested. I am listening to everything about you and I want to know it and what's going on in your life. It's not about me. It's about you. It's about us. This becomes the story of us. And that's what I think is if we live this care out, our narrative, the story of us in any us relationship is a very strong, very secure, very attached relationship that we love and care about each other. And to me, I describe these as the ingredients to being able to love brilliantly. When we can love brilliantly in any type of relationship we're in, with these as the hallmark characteristics, we are in a very positive, stable, safe, secure, emotionally attached relationship. And um, well, there's something else I, I want to come back to, but I'll see you, Linda, if that makes sense and um, answers your question of what you where you're going. Yeah, I think it I think it answers the question beautifully, and I think it's just a good starting point for people that are looking for some tools on how to improve their relationship. So I do have a question here from Elizabeth that I want to uh, see what you say to this, Charles. So Elizabeth says, if you do your part and you show up and listen and transcend joy, but the other person at work or family life most often does not like this, do we just get away or how do we cope with that? And then she put, as in work, you have to work closely with them and then notice by the end of the day, you're negative too. So ideas on that, Charles, do you just have to cope with it or get away from it? How, how does someone manage something like that? Yeah, that's a great question. And I, I think I missed a part in that middle section, but before the, do you just cope with it? Can you go back to that part, Linda? So if you do your part to show up to listen and transcend joy, but the other person at work or family is not like this, do you just get away or how do you cope with that? Okay, that's the part that I miss. Do you just get away? So, yeah, I mean, that's what a wonderful question. I mean, that was really, really great. And um, gosh, it, it's a tough one too, because it ties a little bit back to what you were talking earlier that we can't change anybody else. We can change ourselves. And it does come down to we can impact and we can influence. But one thing when I was talking earlier about those mirror neurons and how we kind of take on the contagiousness of something or somebody, and there's kind of studies on this where the stronger personality or the stronger emotion kind of wins out. It's almost like what's stronger, the positivity or the negativity. And even if the positivity doesn't rub off on the other person, because we might not be able to change them. And some people, and this is another example that everybody has probably experienced, there's some people who can be so caught up in their own negativity or whatever might be going on with them that they have this conscious or subconscious barrier to transcendent joy that uh, Elizabeth was talking about. It's almost like, wow, there's nothing you could do that's gonna make this person seem either happy or accepting of my positivity. And you do have to have some acceptance of, at least I tried everything that I could to form a positive relationship with this person. And if there is an opportunity for me, to, whenever we do interact to at least maintain my positivity, that's going to be good. And I have the recognition that I don't want to take on that that might be coming from that other person. So it's again, another instance of self-awareness. I can't change the other person, but my healthy boundaries are gonna help maintain me not falling prey into that type of negativity, maintain my own personal stance of where I am. And that really transitions well into the next question we had. So Maria is asking, and I totally relate to this. How do you set a healthy boundary, especially when you're an empathetic, caring person? 
is it like to that same type of situation? Is there any more uh, to the question? Is that it? Uh, that was, that was just, oh, she said yes. Okay. Yeah, it's that same thing as that. So you, you sometimes you go back to it. I've seen people who is, I will never give up on developing a good relationship with that person. And I'll say, you know what? Great. Keep going for it. That is great. Keep working. Keep going in that direction. That is wonderful. But knowing that you may not, eventually you may. I've, I've known many relationships where the start of it wasn't that great. And the person eventually won the other person over. These things could happen. This is how when Harry met Sally movies type happen is that it wasn't there, it wasn't there, it wasn't there, but then it's there. So it doesn't mean we, we don't have to try if we have that empathy and we want it to work out. But I always say going into it eyes wide open. It may, but it may not. It's the one who always seems optimistic, but then let down, seems like the one who's hurt. And I'm not saying don't be optimistic either. But what I am saying is, you know, do it with the idea that, hey, it can't hurt, right? Let, let me give it a try. And you keep doing it, and then maybe eventually it does blossom into something, uh, but that's not always the case. But it doesn't mean give up right away, keep trying, and eventually you may get there. But then in the boundaries, being able to say, look, I've tried three or four times. I get it. And a person's told me in their own way, this is, this is where we're at, and I can reach acceptance with, it, with that. There's other people that I can strive to have positive and healthy relationships with as well. Excellent. And I think, too, that uh, when you are that caring, empathetic person, sometimes you, you just do keep trying, and you just also have to balance that between knowing what's healthy for you. And so sometimes you do have to set that boundary, like, well, this isn't healthy for me to keep, to keep trying in this relationship, and, and sometimes you, you kind of have to figure that out. Well, I think that is a great way to look at it is uh, where am I in this? If I'm, if this is, if, if I'm doing this more for that person only and, and all I'm getting is the cold shoulder, uh, maybe this isn't, you know, necessarily where I need to be spending my best and, and full energy. And is it actually getting me down and negatively affecting? If it's that positive place, oh, I tried, you know, I gave it to, you know, then that is great. If it's, wow, I just keep feeling that I'm getting bogged down in this, then maybe that's an indicator that this isn't the healthiest move for you. And maybe you do have to pivot on to other relationships. Or at least just casually accept that this is where this one is at. It doesn't have to be bad that we don't have a great relationship or I'm not changing their way about them. You know, there, there's maybe something good in that as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, that was all I had for questions. If anybody else has a question, feel free to pop it in there. But as we kind of wrap up here today, Charles, any parting thoughts on, on relationships and how we can continue to, to prioritize them, to make them uh, valuable in our lives, how to work on them? Parting thoughts from you today. Yes, I had to tell you what I have found over the years or maybe other than what I've already said, probably the most important aspects of relationship lives and experiences, both as marriages and any other one, which is we need something that I describe as bi-directional influence, that I can favorably influence you and you could favorably influence me. And in that influence, whether it's a couple buying a car or buying a new home, relationships that seem to be influences one-sided. I decide everything, you acquiesce to it. Even if you think of a supervisor, supervisee relationship, the best ones are the ones that have bi-directional influence. Tell me what you're thinking. Tell me where you think we should go. Yeah, well, let me hear yours too. Um, I think of it as, um, and if we were on a football field, there's one end zone and there's another end zone. The better we can both come somewhere to the middle in the way we influence rather than one always having to go to the other end zone and just meet where they are, 
when there isn't favorable bi-directional influence, that relationship is going to have some struggles. It's not if, it's a matter of varying degrees, how much that relationship may struggle. So we have to be able to have the influence in both ways. It doesn't always have to be perfectly in the middle of the field, but it has to be at least both of us coming out of the end zone to be able to be effective in our relationship. And I've seen many supervisor supervisee situations over the years where that's what people say is, you know, my relationship with my boss is my most difficult part of my day. Well, why is that? He or she doesn't listen. He or she doesn't care to know where I'm coming from. And in the supervisee supervisor relationship, there's that dynamic where that person now has influence over your life and control over your well-being. And if that isn't in a trusting place, then that's going to that's going to suffer. Um, the other one is, again, across the board, but this one's more about um, couples relationship is something that John Gottman, one of the leading authorities in the world of human relationships, that's for anybody interested, G-O-T-T-M-A-N, if you're not already familiar with him. He has something that he has a, a laboratory out at the University of Washington in Seattle, and he studies relationships, and he has something down into the neighborhood of 92 to 95% predictability of a couple relationship that will last or will falter. And one of those things is how we affect the other person's well-being and physiology, that uh, do we stress the other person out or do we make the other person feel more comfortable? And if we get nothing else out of this, this conversation today, I hope any and all of you think about this dynamic because it's that crucial to our relationships. How am I affecting the person that I'm with? whenever I'm talking to. So it goes full, full circle back to that, how am I showing up? And the reason that is so important is how we show up is going to be physiologically indicative of how people respond to us, and especially in those committed relationships. So Gottman has a number of different books, The Seven Principles of a Healthy Relationship, umpteen thousand YouTube videos, so if you ever want to learn and look at more of healthy relationships, John Gottman would be one of the best starting places for you. Sue Johnson, uh, Emotionally Focused Therapy, she has her own website. Uh, Sue Johnson homepage would be another great resource for you. And uh, very interesting information from both of those, but among the leading authorities in the world of relationships, um, across, not just in our country, but um, throughout. Perfect. Lots of great wisdom in there, Charles. Um, some great references for some resources, too, if people really want to dig in and learn a little bit more. So, great. Well, thank you so much to our audience for joining us today. We hope that this was a helpful conversation for you as you continue to work on your relationships. and. Uh, Charles, thanks again for taking the time to uh, give us that mental health moment that we all we all always need when, when we get to listen to you. So thank you so much. Great, and I hope everybody keeps caring. Keep caring and keep enjoying your relationships. And thank you so much for today. Happy Valentine's Day to everybody as well. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.